Welcome to the Deep Dive. Today, we're tackling a topic that, well, it affects so many of us and seems to come with a constant stream of confusing updates. High cholesterol mm. and its connection to heart disease. You've likely heard it's a major threat. But then, you know, you also hear rumblings that maybe it's not quite so simple. It's definitely confusing out there. So our mission today is to try and cut through some of that noise. We want to give you a clear understanding of the two main ways of looking at cholesterol risk. Right. So basically, we're looking at this shift, aren't we? Yeah. From the old idea that high cholesterol is the problem mm -hmm. to this newer idea that maybe, just maybe, it's damaged cholesterol particles that are the real issue. That's the core tension, yeah. That's what we need to unpack. Uh, yeah. Because for decades, I mean, the main view, which really started back in the late 1950s with Ansel Keys. Ansel Keys, right? Yeah. The idea was pretty straightforward. Mm. Saturated fats in your diet raise cholesterol, specifically LDL cholesterol. The bad cholesterol, as they called it. Exactly. And this directly leads to heart disease. That became, well, pretty firmly established. When did that really take hold? You saw the American Heart Association adopt it in 1961, and then the U.S. government's dietary guidelines in 77 really cemented it, telling everyone to cut back on saturated fat. And Key's seven countries study was key to that, wasn't it? It played a huge role, absolutely. But I seem to recall hearing there were some questions about that study, how it was put together. That's right. Yeah, there's been criticism. People have pointed out that the countries he chose but while well, wasn't maybe the full picture. How so? Well, for example, countries like France or Switzerland, you know, high saturated fat intake, but lower heart disease rates. They weren't in the study. They weren't included. But countries that seemed to fit his theory, like Yugoslavia or Finland, they were. So naturally, questions about selection bias came up. Okay, right. That makes sense. So the initial scare was really focused on saturated fats. What foods are we actually talking about there? Just to be clear. Sure. Think about everyday stuff like uh, milk, butter, cheese. The dairy aisle, basically. Pretty much. And red meats, beef, lamb, pork, also chicken skin. And then some plant oils, too, like palm oil, palm kernel oil, coconut oil. Coconut oil, too. Interesting. Yeah, they're all high in saturated fats. And the traditional thinking was eating these directly bumps up your LDL. Okay. And has that idea just vanished? Or is there still research kind of backing that up? No, it hasn't vanished completely. You still see studies pointing that way. For instance, there was a study in 2020 linking red meat to higher heart disease risk. Uh, and it suggested, you know, swapping it for plant protein could actually lower LDL. So even within that older view, it sounds like maybe it's getting a bit more complex. Like I've heard talk about inflammation, the gut. You're right. Yeah, the thinking has evolved somewhat even within that framework. There was a 2023 study looking at animal products and the gut. Right. So the idea is maybe those effects are the real drivers, not just the direct impact on the LDL number itself. But despite all that complexity, current medical guidelines, they still really focus on LDL levels, don't they? Oh, absolutely. Big institutions like Johns Hopkins Medicine, they still stress LDL as a key risk marker. So what do they recommend? Well, for people who already have heart disease, they generally recommend statins if their LDL is 70 milligrams per deciliter or higher. 70. And for people without heart disease, if their LDL is consistently over 190 on a couple of tests, uh -huh. they recommend checking for something called familial hypercholesterolemia, basically, a genetic thing that causes super high cholesterol. Wow. So the focus on LDL is still very much there in the official guidelines. Very much so. It shows you why lowering cholesterol remains such a major focus for so many doctors and patients. Right. Which makes this other perspective, the one that challenges this whole LDL heart disease link, even more intriguing. What's the main idea there? The fundamental difference really is questioning whether high total LDL is automatically the problem. Dr. Sten Ekberg uses this analogy I find helpful. Oh yeah. What's that? He says, think of cholesterol like a first responder at an accident scene. A first responder? Huh. Okay. How does that work? Well, think about it. When there's damage in an artery, cholesterol shows up. It's part of the body's repair crew. Oh, I see. Just like paramedics are always at a car crash, seeing cholesterol at the site of arterial damage doesn't automatically mean the cholesterol caused the crash. So correlation isn't causation. Exactly. That's the crucial point. Just because cholesterol is found in plaques doesn't prove it started the fire, so to speak. Okay, that makes sense. So if it's not just the amount of LDL, what is this newer science looking at instead? What's the potential bad guy. The focus really shifts to the quality of the LDL particles. Are they damaged? 
damage how? Usually through oxidation reacting with free radicals or glycation, which is basically getting gummed up with sugar molecules. Okay. Dr. Eckberg explains that these damaged, small, dense LDL particles, those are the ones more likely to get stuck in artery walls and build up plaque. And the liver doesn't clear them out as easily. Right. Healthy LDL gets recycled pretty efficiently, but these damaged ones tend to hang around longer and potentially cause more problems. That distinction seems critical. Not just high LDL, but damaged LDL. And what about cholesterol itself? I mean, our bodies make it for a reason, right? We need it. Oh, absolutely vital. Cholesterol does so many essential things. Dr. Nadir Ali points out it's crucial for making coenzyme Q10, CoQ10. CoQ10 for energy production. Yes, essential for our mitochondria, the powerhouses in our cells. And this ties into concerns some people, like Dr. Dwayne Graveline, have raised about statins. The cholesterol-lowering drugs. Right. Concerns about potential side effects, like memory loss, possibly linked to lowering the cholesterol needed for things like CoQ10. And that concern about statin side effects that seems like a big piece of this alternative view. It really is. Research by Dr. Lance Joan, which Dr. Ali often cites, looked at people on statins versus controls. And what did they find? Well, some notable differences. Things like higher blood pressure, higher blood sugar, lower CoQ10 levels in muscles. Mm -hmm. Also, fewer enzymes that protect against oxidative damage, problems with energy generation, and more insulin resistance. Those sound like pretty significant metabolic effects. Yeah. And is it just lab results or are patients actually feeling these things? Well, anecdotally, Dr. Lance Truman observed that about half of his patients on statins reported issues. Like what kind of issues? Things like muscle pain, myalgias fatigue, feeling short of breath, memory fog. Wow, 50%. That's a lot. It is. And interestingly, he noted many felt better when they stopped the statins. Okay, this really complicates the picture, doesn't it? that just pushing cholesterol down with drugs might not be a simple win. It certainly suggests we need to weigh the benefits against potential downsides more carefully. So what about diet in this newer view? The old view blamed saturated fat. How does this emerging science connect food and heart health? This is where things get really fascinating. Look at studies like the Keto CTA trial. David Feldman was involved in that. What did they do? They followed people with high LDL cholesterol, who were on ketogenic diets for a year. They tracked plaque in their arteries. Oh, and what was the connection to LDL? Here's the kicker. Changes in ApoB, that's a protein on LDL particles, a good measure of particle number. Okay. Changes in ApoB didn't correlate with plaque getting worse. <laughs> really? So having more LDL particles didn't mean more plaque progression in these people? Not in this specific group, no. What did predict plaque getting worse was already having plaque there to begin with. Ah. Which led them to suggest, for this group at least, plaque begets plaque. ApoB does not. But you emphasized this group. Who were they? Right. Very important point. These were metabolically healthy individuals whose high LDL seemed to be a result of the ketogenic diet. So it might not apply to everyone with high LDL. Still, that's a pretty striking finding for people on keto diets. It suggests high LDL in that context might not mean the same thing. Exactly. It adds a layer of nuance. The context seems to matter. Which brings me to this lean mass hyperresponder idea. I've heard that term. What is that? Right. LMHR. It refers to a pattern seen in some people, usually lean, very active, metabolically healthy folks on very low carb, high fat diets. And what happens with their cholesterol? They can develop extremely high LDL cholesterol levels, like really high, but often alongside very high HDL, the good cholesterol and very low triglycerides. So high LDL, but other markers look great. Generally, yes. You see this described in journals like JCC, Advances, and on NCBI. These individuals look healthy otherwise, but their LDL is sky high by traditional standards. So what's their actual risk? Do we know? That's the million dollar question. The long-term risk for LMHRs with these extreme LDL levels is still being actively studied. It's really an open question. But the very existence of this group challenges that simple high LDL, high risk equation. It absolutely does. It forces us to consider the bigger picture. Okay, so let's try to pull this together. We have these two quite different narratives, don't we? We do. One is the view we've had for ages. Saturated fat bad, raises LDL, clogs arteries, need medicine. That's the traditional pathway, yes. Then there's this emerging view. Maybe total LDL isn't the main villain. Maybe it's damaged LDL, inflammation, overall metabolic health, and maybe saturated fat isn't the primary driver, and the drugs aren't always the answer. 
That sums up the challenge pretty well. It questions the direct causality and the universal approach. For the average person just trying to figure this out, what's the main takeaway then? It feels overwhelming. I think the biggest takeaway is that heart disease risk is complex. Way more complex than just one number. Like Healthline says, it's multifactorial. Exactly. And remember how we mentioned foods high in cholesterol are often also high in saturated fat? <laughs> so maybe the issues linked to those foods, inflammation, gut stuff, are more about the saturated fat itself or something else entirely rather than the dietary cholesterol content per se. And just tweaking your diet generally. That might not drastically change your cholesterol numbers anyway. Often not dramatically, no. Meta-analyses show general dietary advice usually leads to only modest lipid changes. So you need big shifts. Yeah, significant changes usually require pretty major dietary shifts like going fully low-fat vegetarian. And the changes are often bigger if you start with higher levels. And we haven't even touched much on genetics or other lifestyle factors. Right. Genetics can influence things like how your HDL responds to alcohol, for instance. It's all interconnected and very individual. Okay, so recapping the core conflict. Established view saturated fat, high LDL heart disease, need statins. That's the classic model, yes. Emerging view. Maybe LDL number isn't the issue. Maybe it's damaged LDL particles, inflammation, metabolic health. Saturated fat's role is questioned statin of necessity and side effects are considered, cholesterol's vital functions are highlighted. Precisely. Things like the keto CTA trial and the LMHR phenomenon really poke holes in the simplicity of the old model. So for our listener navigating all this, mm -hmm. what's the crucial thing to grasp from our deep dive today? I'd say the most vital point is that heart health isn't just about one number on a lab report. Focusing only on total cholesterol or even just LDL it's likely giving you an incomplete picture. You need to look broader. Exactly. Think about inflammation markers, look at your triglycerides, your blood sugar, your overall metabolic health. Maybe even consider things like LDL particle size or APOB levels if you can. So rather than just seeing a high cholesterol number and panicking, maybe the conversation with the doctor needs to be different. Ideally, yes. It should prompt a more nuanced discussion. Moving past just LDL and exploring your specific individual risk factors much more thoroughly, this has been really, really helpful. It's just so clear that our understanding here is still evolving and maybe this simple story we've been told for decades. Yeah. It just isn't the whole story. Agreed. It's an ongoing scientific debate and it really highlights why we need more research and definitely a, a more personalized approach to figuring out cardiovascular risk. Okay, so here's a final thought for everyone listening to chew on. Given this ongoing debate, the conflicting information and how personal health really yeah. is, what specific questions should you be asking your own doctor about your risk factors, your cholesterol panel, and the real pros and cons of any treatments being suggested? Maybe it's time to push past that simple good versus bad cholesterol story and really dig into what matters for your heart health. Thanks for joining yeah. us on this deep dive.